we head to one of the world's greatest industrial icons to find out what it takes to be a bridge rigger. And how about making your living, tracking down deadly snakes for their venom? Or being a fuel pump attendant, 10,000 metres up in the air? If you're not prone to vertigo and are physically tough, there's a rare job in Australia on offer. Mention Sydney, and your first thought is likely to be Harbour Bridge. It took 1,400 men eight years to build, and when it opened in 1932, it's the longest single-span steel arch bridge in the world. Now, more than 160,000 vehicles cross in both directions every day. With around 50,000 tonnes of steel rising above the highway, the safety of everyone below falls to men like the bridge rigger. 42-year-old George Napier certainly has an unusual job. All day, any weather, you'll find him 135 metres above the water. There's no danger money in this job, as the basic salary is around 31,000 euros a year. For riggers like George, keeping the Sydney Harbour Bridge in top condition is something you do for love. We maintain it, we paint it, we cut the rust, and we look after it, and uh, do any repairs that need doing to it. So I can attach to anywhere on the bridge to stop me falling. OK, I'll fall about two, three metres. OK, these are the leg straps. They're kind of most important. Make sure they're tight. Otherwise, if you slip, it can be very painful. Being a bridge rigger requires the skills of an engineer, a mountaineer and a lot more besides. George's varied career history fits the bill. Like I left school at 15, I was a butcher. I was a painter and decorator, I joined the army, I joined a commando unit, and I came to Australia uh, with the intent of just having a holiday. Life was good here, so I just ended up staying. Even now, after eight years, I still enjoy going up. I still really, I like to take my time, I like to have a look around. If I didn't work on the bridge, I would go on bridge climb. I was for sure, I just, one thing I always wanted to do was climb the Harbour Bridge. Every day starts in the riggers loft, agreeing the plan of action. Safety is always top of the agenda. Mavericks need not apply. If you're working in a high risk area, make sure you've got your mask on. In this job, teamwork can make the difference between life and death. Yep, yep George. Yes. Can you reinforce emergency procedures to everyone here? It's a broken uh, alarm. Uh, just get in touch with the office. Yep. And if it's a straight alarm, get straight off the bridge, get your. That's point. point. Good, very good, George. Thank you. Rigging is also an expensive business, with the annual cost of maintaining the bridge running to around five million Australian dollars. Well, this is our riggers' loft. This is where we keep all our rigging equipment, our ropes, our slings, our shackles, uh, anything we need for the day's job. The day's first task, hoisting the national flag. With that done, it's over to vital repairs of some of the six million rivets that hold the bridge together. OK, well, my job here today, I'm here to mark up some of these rivets. Some of them are severely rusted. So if I just mark them, then the painters, when they come along, they'll know which ones have to be taken back to bare metal and, uh, and repainted before they rust completely and fall away. So if I just carry on marking a few of these, up here, spots. one slip could be fatal. The riggers have to look out for each other. Basically, we work on the bridge a buddy system where we get always two men go together on any job at all, and you bond with a bloke as soon as you're, you're out the door. You know, your life actually depends on the guy above you. We all trust each other in the rigging loft. We've all been through, you know, every job we can do, and we all trust each other. Everyone plays their part. It's kind of a a joint thing. You know, without the riggers, the painters can't get to work. If we build a platform, there's no painters. It's pointless building it. So it's kind of a group job. Despite all the safety systems, this still tests the nerves. 
And did you know, Paul Hogan of Crocodile Dundee fame began his working life as a rigger. A strong stomach and knowing how to work those ropes and pulleys are de rigueur for any rigger. The Sydney Harbour Bridge cost €6 million Euros to build, and nearly 80% of the metal needed for the construction was shipped in from the United Kingdom. Today, it's foreign imports of a different kind up here. Terry is a climbing tour guide. At 25, she's the youngest and one of only a few female members of the crew. I've been working here for just over two years, um, but I'm also a part-time musician and that's what I was doing before. Well, I will say it's very hard to come to work in a bad mood and then leave in a bad mood after you've done a climb because doing a climb, you're giving your energy to 12 people. You want them to have a fantastic experience and three hours of being upbeat and enthusiastic, it has to put you in a good mood. So I do love that about the job too. Climbing the bridge only started in 1998 and has already attracted over a million visitors. To do this job, you need to be fit and good with people, as there's no knowing just how visitors will react. Well, I remember one time I had a lady on my climb who was incredibly nervous. Uh, she was determined to do the whole thing. She was climbing with her two teenage children and they really wanted to do the climb, but even up here on the arch, she was hanging on to those handrails and she climbed the whole way, kind of like this, around the bridge. But um, she did it, and she was very proud of herself. From the top, it's 200 vertiginous steps down. But the unique 360-degree views over the harbour make it all worthwhile. For George, it's the end of another day. Muscle stiff from having to hold his position for hours on end. Tired and windswept. You might ask, why does he do it? I still feel proud to tell people I'm a rigger on the Harbour Bridge. So, if you feel like ditching the desk job and joining the crew on Sydney's Harbour Bridge, step this way. Still to come, there's a career to be had as a mid-air fuel attendant. But first, Two and a half thousand kilometres from Sydney to northern Queensland. Could you do a job where you have to stick your hands into tubs of writhing venomous snakes? A job where the possibility of the fatal bite is a daily reality. Risk your life for the sake of science. This man can. Dr Brian Fry is a venom hunter. In this job, you have to be a qualified scientist, scuba diver, and snake charmer. America-born Brian and his Australian wife Alexia have a number one speciality, sea snakes. It's their business to know how they live, what they eat, and how their poison works. For most people, snakes are terrifying, but for me, there's something fascinating. I like nothing better than going face to face with some of the most dangerous snakes in the world. Brian has already been bit 24 times. Only on the spot anti venom jabs have stopped him from dying. Today, they're going out to sea to a field site in Weepa. Thanks, <laughs> Weepa is located in the northern part of the state of Queensland in Australia. There's two big capes that form this vast, shallow, warm body of water called the Gulf of Carpentaria. What makes Weepa so special is that the animal life is absolutely amazing. It is truly a Serengeti event. They've been working these waters ever since their university years. But there's one deadly snake that's proven elusive, the stoke. There's about 18 species that are found in this water. In the years that we've been searching here, we've caught 10. Our holy grail is to get a young stoke sea snake because this is the great white of the sea snake worlds. If we can get a small stoke sea snake and get it established, it's like getting a great white to live in captivity. We need to search for the snakes at night time. Basically what happens is the snakes go down to feed at night when the fish are resting, then they come up to the surface to digest. 
And that's when we get them with the light, scoop them up, chuck them in the bin. Yep, you're on. All right. Snake, Dave, oh, Snake, no, bring on the no, left. The stoat is the biggest of all sea snakes. They want to catch a baby that they could keep in the lab to milk its venom. Go and dive, go down there. Not a stoke this time, but still a great catch. Oh, wow. Uh, you're a nice chopper. That's a big one. Yeah, not bad. It's a, this is a male spine-bellied sea snake. Only the males get these heavy spines like this. People often think of snakes as the bigger the deadlier. It's not necessarily the case. Dead is dead. Can they find the mysterious stoke before the night is out? They land another snake, and it's a species Brian has met before. Is this a horn? Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. This is my nemesis. This is the species that almost killed me about two years ago. Same species, but a little bit bigger. I was paralyzed quite quickly, and without antivenom, I would have died. And it took me actually about eight months to recover from the bite. Of all the bites that I've had, this was by far the worst. I'd rather take another death adder bite than get another bite by a sea snake. The average snake researcher can expect to earn between 30 and 45,000 euros a year. Pretty low for a job where your life can hang in the balance. When Brian got bitten, I was down at the dock doing water changes. The first thing I heard was Brian yelling at me, Lex! And I knew immediately. I ran up to check that he wasn't suffering from an allergic shock, the most immediate problem for us. I got the pressure bandage on, wrapped it up his arm. I got Brian straight to the car to get to the hospital, the most important point of a venomous bite. Brian's lips were green, his face was white. I could see the venom working on him. Until Brian is through the first 24 hours, there's no certainty that he will live. It's clear that this is not a job for the untrained. Brian has a doctorate in biochemistry, plus several years' experience in the field. He also has something that neither money nor experience can buy. A single-minded passion for his science. Oh, and it helps if you like homework. Venom is a specialised chemical cocktail that the snakes inject to you when they bite you. What it is, is they've taken an ancient saliva gland and evolved it into this chemical arsenal factory. And it pumps out some of the most virulent poisons known to man. What I'm doing here is I'm taking this piece of plastic, a laboratory pipette, and I'm sliding it over the hollow hypodermic-like needle fangs that the snakes have. And then they inject the venom into this. This way we capture all of the venom, which to us is quite precious. Venom is so powerful that this little bit from one fang is enough to kill two or three people. There it is over there. As well as dedication, being a snake venom expert requires patience. The next day out at sea brings the reward. A stoke. Yes! Wow! Perfect size. Excellent. This is our holy grail of the trip, right here. Oh. Perfect. Yeah. Bloody excellent. Oh, look, it's just had a food. It's good, we can find out what it's been feeding on. Yeah. This is our holy grail for the trip. This is the rarest of the sea snakes that we've been searching for. This is a Stoke sea snake. It's only the third one that we've ever caught in all the time that we've been coming here. And it's perfect size to establish in captivity. Full grown. This snake will have a head the size of my fist, 
will be about two meters long, the body about that deep. This is basically the great white of the sea snake world. This is the biggest sea snake. The fangs on an adult are almost a centimeter long and it can give 150 milligrams of a venom that it takes only three to five milligrams to kill you of. It's just the ultimate sea snake. Bloody excellent. Awesome. If you are up for around 10 years of higher education in a competitive and deadly environment, maybe venom hunting is your calling. Next up, a job where one slip of the joystick can literally be explosive. The man who refuels fighter planes in the sky is alive and well and living in the UK. The English countryside hides a unique force of men. Highly trained in cutting edge military weapons and able to deploy at a moment's notice. This is a US Air Force fleet of fighter jets. And there's one thing these planes need more than anything. Fuel. Clearly, they can't just pull in at the nearest gas station. These guys have to refuel in mid-air. Bandy K is the boom operator. A boom operator is a refueler aboard a tanker aircraft. This must be one of the coolest and most nerve-wracking jobs in the Air Force. Randy works on board a KC-135 as part of the 351st Air Refueling Squadron. The planes he refuels are the Black Panther F-15s, belonging to the 494th Fighter Squadron at RAF Lakenheath in the UK. The Black Panthers are in high demand. Just two weeks after helping patrol over northern Iraq, the 494th took part in Operation Allied Force. Flying more than 4,000 combat hours was largely due to the heroic efforts of the maintenance crews, including boom operators like Randy. He received nearly a year of schooling to prepare him for the job. Everything from survival skills to weapons training was needed before he could get the thumbs up to fly the boom on his own. He works alongside a crew who are all specialists in their own right. Captain O'Connell, call sign Silent Warrior, is at the helm of the filling plane, a top pilot with 14 years experience. My name is uh, Jim O'Connell, Air Force pilot currently, uh, flight commander. Oh, I'm just I'm the luckiest man in the world. I get to go take a KC-135 and go every fuel somebody somewhere and work with wonderful people, whether it's the crew, the maintenance folks that you have to deal with. And it's a great team effort. Randy's now been doing this job for 12 years, but he'll never get complacent. What we're doing is we're checking our oxygen so we have a supplemental breathing source in case of an emergency decompression, we'll be able to breathe. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test the mask using this regulator to make sure I have no leaks or anything around my face so I can have a good seal to breathe. A typical day for a boom operator is long. Refueling missions can last anywhere from five to 14 hours. We are a, a flying gas station. If that was to catch on fire, you're talking a giant fireball. Black Panthers are underway. They're on a patrol sortie over the North Sea. 640 kilometers away, the refueling crew is already close to the rendezvous position. The mission would be what I would just call a receiver exercise. We uh, 
scheduled uh, to take off at 8.57 local, uh, Milton Hall, England time. Go up, refuel 12 F-16s and two F-15s. Refueling 14 aircraft could take up to 10 hours. Randy gets ready for their first visitor. The first thing I do when I get back there is uh, run a couple of checklist items and then uh, I lower the boom. The boom is the long arm that delivers the fuel. One false move could send both planes tumbling out of the sky. The tanker has over 100,000 litres of high octane fuel on board. In short, it's a flying bomb. Now on my left hand, I control a telescope lever. On my right hand, I control a rotavator stick. The rotavator stick is basically what controls the two black rotavators that are on the boom. I'm giving him a light switch. At 10 feet, I start flashing the light, telling him, hey, you should start slowing your rate of closure. So, at 10,000 meters, traveling at 800 kilometers per hour and facing backwards, you have to guide the boom into a target hole no centimetres across. Only apply for this job if you can stay cool under pressure and keep absolute concentration. As they're coming in, uh, they could be coming in uh, too fast and underrun the boom and get up underneath us. Underneath us is a bad thing. I hopefully recognize that and we would say breakaway, breakaway. Job done, the plane carefully maneuvers away. As getting caught in the slipstream of the huge tanker could send the fighter out of control. One down, 13 to go. Part of a boom operator's job is to constantly check the position of the fighters relative to the tanker. One of the most important requirements for Randy is to keep a sense of perspective. On a day that I'm going to fly, I try not to think about crashing, anything gone wrong with the plane or anything like that. Pilots that I'm flying with for the day, also in our skills, that uh, anything that should happen that we might be able to overcome. And I like to think positive, and if you think positive, hopefully nothing bad's going to happen. Accidents and mechanical failure are constant threats. and. Should anything not go exactly to plan, the emergency response team is on hand to deal with the situation. Fortunately, this time it's a false alarm. But when you're flying this close to the edge, nothing can be taken for granted. Despite the dangers, this is a unique and exciting career with new challenges every mission, and where trust and teamwork are part of everyday life. As a boom operator, there he's my eyes and ears. This aircraft that's coming in high speed, and he's making that contact, making sure that we're all safe. I know he's 100%. I am confident in Randy. I've been flying for about 12 years. I've got about 4,000 hours of flight time. I think personally it's probably the best job in the United States Air Force for an enlisted guy to have. And I plan on probably doing another 18 years or so. When it comes to having an unusual job, we reckon a boom operator clinches it. Three rough trades, all needing insane amounts of bravery and dedication. Would you be hard enough? 